What's up, everybody? How you doing today? It's great to see you. Hey, how'd your football team do last week? That sounds great. I care zero. Listen, I, I was at Panera. I was at Panera this week, and I was meeting with somebody, and they had on a Steelers hoodie, and um, some guy walked by. And was like, yeah, man, the game. And I don't know what's going on. And so he he talked for like, literally, he stood there and talked to us for about, I don't know, 10 minutes about, yeah, and then, you know, everything that happened last night. And I just was like, (laughs) literally, I had no clue who he was. He had no clue who I was. But this guy had on a Steelers hoodie, and he wanted to stand and talk. And so after that whole exchange, I realized just how much of a religion sports really is. He's like, you have a creed, I have a creed, it's the same creed, let's talk. And so that was wild. But congrats to whoever won and sorry to whoever lost. Um, Football season will be over soon and you can be happy again, okay? Does that sound good? Uh, We're talking about progress right now. We're talking about progress and how things change And change is not uh, always a good thing. Change is sometimes a bad thing. Progress is changing in the right direction. And I want to talk to you about a direction today that's maybe a crazy direction. It's a different direction that we don't think about when we think about change, okay? Um, When we think about progress, we typically think of direction of up, out, forward, more, there, right? When we think of progress... But today I want to talk to you about the progress of down. The progress of down. Let me pray and then I'll get into this. God, thank you that you are with us, that you are here speaking to us, that you're growing us, maturing us by your word today. God, would you challenge us? Would you mature us? Would you uh, help us to actually progress that this year would be a great year for us? In the name of Jesus, come on, everybody said, Amen. amen, amen, amen. I want you to look at this verse in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Go back to the beginning of this verse here. It says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the way, nor stands in the way, nor sits in the seat. I think a lot of times we think that progress just equals moving. And as long as I'm moving, then I am progressing. If I am walking, then I am progressing. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you're walking in the wrong direction. Sometimes you're walking in the way of sinners. Sometimes you're standing still. You know, I don't need to fight. I just need to stand still. But sometimes you're standing still with sinners, Well, sometimes I just need to sit down and rest. Well, sometimes you're sitting down and resting in the way of sinners. So what is this verse trying to get us to understand? It's not the walking. It's not the standing. It's not the sitting that's the problem. It's what we're partnered with that's the problem. Are we partnered with the way of sinners or are we partnered with something different? Now, I don't know who in here loves yard work, okay? Uh... I love cutting the grass because hop on, I hop on a riding mower. I, someone convinced me I needed to get a riding mower, and I was like, okay, let's do it. I hopped on a riding mower, and I love it. And I remember literally we had a babysitter watching our kids one day, um, and I went out and was cutting the grass, and when they saw me sitting on a riding mower, they just busted out laughing. Like, this is hilarious. But now it has become a part of who I am. I love the riding mower. My wife loves the leaf blower, okay? This is so funny. Every fall, if you can't find my wife, 
She's in the yard blowing leaves, okay? And she loves it. So for me, I like, I want to be, um, if I want to, if I want to have peaceful time to myself, I want to be alone. I want to read a book. I want to watch a movie. I want to do something like that. If Kenzie wants alone time, she wants to go out in the yard and blow leaves. That's just how she's wired. And I think it's because she much prefers to hear to mom. She's like, I would much rather hear than mom, 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 mom. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about here, right? So she puts on this backpack mower. I taught her how to get it started. She's out there, you know, 100 pounds. And then the thing starts up and she puts it on and she falls backwards because she's so tiny and she's out there blowing leaves. And she is having the time of her life life. Um, and when I think about this, I think that wind, right? I think of this idea of wind, that wind can be a really good thing, but it also can be a really bad thing. Wind, um, in scripture, we hear about wind, talked about like the wind of God. We, we hear in Genesis chapter 1, it says that the, the, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. The wind of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Or in Acts chapter 2, we see the wind of God blew in, uh, on the church in Acts chapter 2, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Or we see that uh, Adam and Eve, when God breathed life into them, it says he breathed his wind, his breath into them, and they received life. Wind, in that case, can be a really good thing. Wind in our yard, when we're blowing leaves, can be a really good thing because we're funneling the leaves in the direction that they should go. And the wind of God operates like that in our life. It funnels us in the way that we should go. It gives us energy and momentum towards what God has called us to. It's like wind in our sails. It's like we're out on the sea. Without wind, there is no motion. So we need the wind of God. But there's another wind that can be a problem. If you go back to Psalms, that second section there in this in this chapter it says this he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season its leaf does not wither and all he does he prospers the wicked are not so they are like chaff that the wind drives away that the wind drives away the wicked are like people that are blown by the wind they're this way today they're that way tomorrow they're up today, they're down tomorrow. You know, they, they just blow every which way, every which direction. Wherever the wind is blowing, that's how the wicked are. But the Bible says that the righteous are planted like a tree and they prosper. When the wind blows them, they don't blow over. When the wind blows them, they're not knocked away, around. When the wind blows them, they're cool, calm, collected because they're planted and they prosper. If you're gonna get anything from this message today, I want you to connect the idea of being planted with the idea of prospering. All throughout scripture, we see that the Israelites, they wandered in the wilderness and wandering was not a blessing. They wandered because of their hard hearts. They wandered because they didn't trust God. They wandered because they didn't believe. But what God really wanted for them was to take them to a place where they could settle in the land. The promised land means being rooted. It means being settled. It means being planted. It means not wandering around for 40 years aimlessly. It means actually settling in, building your home, you know, settling in, right? And so the righteous, they prosper like a tree. They're planted and they prosper. But the unrighteous, they're like blown around in the wind. And there's three winds that I want to tell you about today that can really knock you around this year. Okay, the first one is in the book of James. James says this. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all 
his ways. This first wind here is the wind of doubt. The wind of doubt. How many people can, in your life, you feel like, man, I will be at church on Sunday morning, and God will be speaking, worship will be going, my hands will be in the air, God's speaking to me, yes, Lord. And then Monday, I'm like, eh, I changed my mind. <laughs> How many of us, God, like, when we're in the presence of God, we're so pumped, we're so excited, we're so set on what God wants from us, and then doubt creeps in, and we talk ourselves out of what God wants in our lives. Doubt. Doubt is not the same as having a question. Okay, Some, I sometimes read scripture and I go, God, I have a question about this. Um, if you've read like, like all of Leviticus, half of Genesis, three-fourths of Numbers, I'm reading scripture and I'm like, God, I'm curious about this passage right here. This is interesting, right? There's a lot of stuff in scripture that might cause us uh, to go, I need to understand this better. Doubt is not the same as having questions. Doubt is when we say, I'm going to trust my subjective feeling in this moment over what God has said to me outright. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. In other words, when you ask, you should trust God's going to give to me liberally and without reproach. He is not a stingy giver. Story just had her birthday, and she got um, like $100 total that people had given her. And uh, she, <laughs> she took Scout out shopping. So she was, she was like, I'm going to take you out, and I'm going to buy you something with my birthday money. It was so sweet. So we go out, and Scout picks this little burrito cat thing. Toys are getting real creative and they're draining my bank account. So, so this little burrito cat thing and she picks it and Story's like, I don't want that. I'm too old for that. So she got a bookmark with a timer for herself. That's not fun. And so all that night she was looking at her bookmark with a timer and she was looking at Scout's cat and she was like, I want this too. So the next day we went back and we got her a burrito because she still had money left, right? But when she's at the store and she's buying this burrito cat thing with Scout, um, she's like, you can get whatever you want. And so Scout picks it out. She goes to the cash register. She checks out. And we're in the car. And it gets really quiet in the car. And I kind of like look in the rear view mirror and Story is staring at Scout. <laughs> and then we hear this. Say thank you. And Scout was just kind of like holding the cat. And she looked at her and she said, say thank you. <laughs> and it went from being like we were really proud of Story for buying Scout this thing to we were like, Story. <laughs> God doesn't give like that. <laughs> God doesn't give like, like, here you go. But then he's like, he's not a stingy giver. He's not a, he's not a I take it back kind of a giver. He gives to all liberally and without reproach. Literally, in the book of Hebrews, it says, anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, when you ask God something and he says he's going to do it, you need to let it be. And if you keep, well, today I don't feel like it's going to work out. Well, today I don't feel like it's going to happen. Well, today I don't feel like that is being driven by your subjective emotion in that moment. It's like being driven by the wind. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. And what James is saying is, no, we don't want to be driven by the wind of doubt. We don't want to be driven by the wind of doubt. Look at this next one. The wind uh, here, it says, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. This is a word right here, mature manhood. This would be great. Let's pray this for 2024. Mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Some of us are driven by the wind of deceit. The wind of deceit. Truth stays the same day after day. Lies change every day. Scout is a little liar, and we're trying to, we're trying to get it out of her. But, those, but her stories change every single day. She wanted to wear high heels to, to school this week. <laughs> and I was like, you cannot wear high heels. You got PE today. And she's like, I wear these every day that I'm in PE. And I'm like, no, you're going to take those off and you're going to wear your Uggs, okay? Those are still cute, but you're going to be safer at things. She's like, no. So she's having a meltdown and she's crying. I always wear these. I always wear these. And then she puts the Uggs on and she thinks they're cute. And then Story is like, hey, those are my Uggs. And she looks at Story and she goes, I always wear these. These are my Uggs. And then I look at her and I'm like, I thought you were the high heels. And she says, I've never worn those high heels. <laughs> Lies change. They shape shift. Truth stays the same. Which is why I cannot stand when somebody says this statement. It's 2024. Get with the times. Truth stays the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. We were wrong about some stuff in the past. We're wrong about some stuff now. We're wrong. But what we're, you know, all of the image that we're moving towards is called the truth. That's what we're moving towards. The truth is going to be what judges us in the future. Not the trend. The truth. The truth is going to be the thing that sets us free. Not the trend. The truth is what we're after. Not the trend. Lies change. They shape shift. The deceit, it moves around. But truth stays the same. We don't want to be people that are tossed around by the wind of deceit. Jesus also tells a story when he's talking about the four soil types. And he says, one of them, they receive the word of God, but then the cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches steal that word from their heart. One of the winds that can blow in our life is the deceit, deceitful doctrines, deceitfulness of riches. It's that, it's that thing that's just like, no, come over here, you're gonna like it over here. When we know what God's called us to, when we know the people that God's called us to be, but we're being driven by the wind. Driven by the wind. We're up today, we're down tomorrow. This is good now, this is bad now. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy, I think it's First or 2 Timothy, he says that in the last times, people are gonna have itchy ears. And they're gonna look for themselves teachers that scratch the itch. Rather than teachers that tell the truth, they're going to look for people that scratch the itch. Well, whatever scratches the itch today might be just a new lie of today. But it might not be the eternal truth of God's word. And so we need to be people who are planted in the eternal. I'm not obsessed with the Bible because I, because I like really old, you know, 2,000-year-old texts. I believe the Bible is the eternal word of God. Which means it is true yesterday, it's true today, it's true tomorrow, it's true forever and ever and ever. I'm not obsessed with old things, I'm obsessed with true things, eternal things, right? Things that are going to last the test of time, things that are going to outlast the trend of the day. You used to wear bell bottoms. <laughs> and now they're like kind of halfway back again. Everyone's pants are getting wider and wider and wider at the bottom. But the trend comes and goes. We don't want to be blown around by trend. We want to be stable in truth, right? So lies come and go. The deceitfulness. You know, in the Garden of Eden, um, this began right away. Deceitful doctrines. Did God really say? You have Adam and Eve. They're standing there. And you have the serpent 
whispering to Eve, did God really say that you're not supposed to eat of this tree, that you'll surely die? Eve was not there when God gave the instruction. Adam was. But Adam was there, and Eve was there, when the serpent was whispering to Eve. So who wasn't doing his job in that moment? The serpent's going, did God really say? And Adam should have been saying, babe, he said it. That's what he said. This is what God said. But Adam was scared of his wife. He was scared. So he just, yeah, oh, babe, I, mm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember him. I don't remember that. I don't remember him saying anything. She, and she believes him because he doesn't remember anything. You know, he should have been cutting the head off of the snake. No, don't you talk about what God said that way, you know? Or, or he should have just not been embarrassed about what God said. I think sometimes we're just, we're embarrassed about what God says, or we don't know, you know, oh, I don't really, or I, we don't believe it ourselves. Men, let me tell you this, in 2024, cut the head off the snake. Cut the head off the snake. And listen, women can cut the head off of snakes too. They can do it too. I'm just saying that, Adam, you were there when God said that. And you're just kind of staring, letting the serpent whisper, dude, cut, grab a shovel, do whatever you need to do, cut the head off of that snake. It is lying, it is deceiving. I think we need to be people who just say, hey, no, I know what God said. I know what God said. I'm not, it's not unclear. Jesus did this for 40 days in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan. Oh, do this, do this, do this. And he would say, no, 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 as it is written. And then he would answer with the word of God. We're not going to be blown around by the, by the winds of deceit. Look at this, this next one, this next one right here. Oh, man, guys, this one's going to get good. I forgot about this one. Jude is probably not going to be the first guy I want to talk to in heaven. After you hear the way he talks, you're going to be like, yeah, I'll meet you later. Okay, this guy is harsh, but he's also a poet. Listen to this. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. These are hidden reefs. These are like invaders, hidden invaders at your love feast. Love feast is what some of the people would call um, communion service, where we're taking communion together. He goes, these are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wow. Twice dead. Why does he say twice dead? Because these people were people who were dead in their sin. They came alive in Jesus, and now they've returned back to their sin. They're twice dead. All of us are born dead in sin. But these people have found life and they have returned back to old dead ways. And so he says, these guys are twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. This guy's harsh. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Man, Jude is only one chapter long, and I think it's because God's like, you guys can't handle any more of that. <laughs> but he's addressing something very specific in his letter. What he's addressing is this whole idea of people who, uh, these people were marked by sexual immorality and rebellion against authority. If you read all of the book of Jude, he's going after two things. He's going after people who are sexually immoral and they reject authority. Now, if you think about this for just a second, um, what he's saying here is that these people are still in church, they're still attending church, and they're acting like everything is cool. Because like you see here, they're attending your love feasts with no fear, with no, 
no shame. They're just kind of attending these things. But what's happening here? They're rejecting the authority of the church. They're rejecting the authority of scripture. They're doing whatever they want, whatever pleases them sexually. And I'm not going after two specific things here, but I will say in our, in our culture, what you can see a lot is this is the day. You know, this is what's in our culture right now that we think that we can just do whatever we want with our bodies, however, and God doesn't care. And we also reject authority. And all of this could be boiled down to what, what are we doing? We're self-defining. We're self-defining. I'm in charge. I write my own way. I say who I am. I say how I feel. You're not going to tell me this. You're not going to tell me what's right. You're not going to tell me what's wrong. What does he say is the thing here? At the very beginning, he says this, relying on their own dreams. They do all this stuff. What does that mean? Now, let me just not say they for a second. Let me say all of us can be guilty here if we're not careful. Relying on our own dreams. What are we doing? We're putting our subjective, our dreams, our desires, whatever it is, we're lifting it up above God. And we're saying my way, my dreams, my vision, my that is more important than what God says. That is more important than what's right. That's more important. And so we elevate our dreams, we elevate our ways up above God. And when we do that, we put ourselves in the position of, I am God, no one's gonna tell me how to live. So these guys were sexually impure and they rejected all authority. And he says it was because of their dreams. Now, he, uh, you, this service is a lot quieter than the last service. Last service was like, yeah, and this service is like, uh, <laughs> that's me. Um, do you have a problem with authority? If you do, then maybe there's something biblically out of line in your life. And I would say this goes all the way back to honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. You know, why well, didn't... I didn't pick my mom and dad. No, God picked them for you. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. Well, I didn't pick my teacher in school. No, that's, but that's your teacher. Um, well, I didn't pick, you know, I didn't vote for this president. Okay, cool, he's the president, okay? Well, I didn't do this. Uh, okay, cool. Like, we have this problem with authority, but it all stems back to we reject the most basic. That's, that's the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. And when we start throwing out that, we start throwing out the foundation of Scripture being what drives our life. And we start to say, my feelings, my emotions, my dreams matter more than what God says. Now this, this thing, dreams here, God is not against you having desires. Everybody has desires Everybody has things they want to accomplish. Everybody has things they want to fulfill. Everybody, but when we elevate our way, our thoughts, our subjective uh, experience, when we elevate that above the firm foundation of Jesus, we start to get really out of whack in our lives. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? So am I telling you not to have ambition? No, you know, do, do, what, do what's in your heart to do as, as far as, what God's calling you to and all that. Should I not have drive? No, you should have drive. You should have these things. But, but when I start lifting my, my thought, my feeling, my dream above the word of God, I'm now being blown around by the wind of dreams. Those dreams could change tomorrow. You know, I, I, I think about this a lot, but when we're young, we come into the world and we... We come into the world and we think like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do this thing and I'm going to change the world and I'm going to, you know, we have these dreams of changing the world and we reject all of the old voices in our life, forgetting that they too were one time young and they too one time were going to change the world. They've got some wisdom because they've read more of the book than you have and when they speak to you, it's very foolish to just throw off everything that they have to say. Because they have lived life too. Now, if you take that idea further and further and further, 
we go all the way back to Scripture knows better than you and I do. Scripture knows better than you and I do. And so when you have dreams and desires, that's totally great. They need to be submitted to God, not God submitted to your dreams and desires. Blown around in the wind. Blown around by the wind of my dreams. You know, I, I, I think about when I was eight years old, I was Buzz Lightyear one weekend because I saw, I saw Toy Story, and then the next weekend I saw James Bond. Yes, my mom let me watch James Bond when I was eight by myself. And then, and then at some point they were like, oh, you should probably close your eyes during these scenes. And then I realized where the scenes were, but instead of closing my eyes, I just fast forwarded through the scenes. And then my dad was like, Kyle, you know if you drink poison fast, it still kills you. <laughs> and because I was watching these films and I was watching the sex scenes, but, my, but I was watching them fast. <laughs> so I was James Bond one weekend and all my friends at school, you're gonna be my Bond girl today. And she's like, okay, this is weird. And then the next day, I watched Star Wars, episode one, Phantom Menace, and I showed up to school with a lightsaber strapped to my body. And then the next day I watched Toy Story and I'm Buzz Lightyear, and I was always doing something different. We don't ever mature out of that. We just change the things we're gonna be when we grow up. We just change the things we wanna do. We, we, we just kind of fake it better as we get older, but that is the problem, is when that's what's in charge of my life, I'm just being driven and tossed by my dreams. These are three winds that can drive us. What's the antidote to the wind? Look back at Psalm chapter one. It says, he is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and all he does, he prospers. The antidote to being driven by the wind of deceit, the wind of my dreams, the wind of doubt is to be planted. Planted means having roots. Roots means progressing down. This means in 2024, my focus is not up and out. My focus is not bigger. My focus is not more fruit. My focus is more root. My focus is dig deeper. <laughs> dig deeper. The wind is going to blow. The news is right now they're firing up all the fans they can and they're gonna get it as windy as they possibly can this year. It's an election year, let's blow the wind. Everything's crazy. You know, you think about life pre-COVID and we were all thinking like, oh, there's a new virus coming, okay, yeah, whatever. And then just a couple weeks later, all of life came to a grinding halt. Change is gonna happen, things are gonna happen. There'll be a virus that comes and goes. There'll be wars that come and go. There'll be all kinds of things that come and go. But you and I are gonna be planted. We're gonna be planted. And because we're planted, we're gonna prosper. In other words, all this weather that's going on around us and we still have fruit on the tree because we have a root system that can't be shaken. We have a root system that can't be shaken. Look at this, look at this right here in uh, Colossians. It says, now just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. The progress I wanna see in our church in 2024 is root progress. I wanna see us grow down into God. I wanna see us grip tighter of God this year. I wanna see us grow in our faith. I wanna see us grow in our trust. I wanna see us grow in our faithfulness. I wanna see us grow all the boring stuff, okay? The exciting stuff is we were on the news because we just did this thing. And uh, you know, the exciting stuff is all these big, we just won this award for, uh, you know, we just, that's the big, fun, shiny, exciting stuff. It's not even really what fulfills us. Being planted, is, it, that is like the coolest thing you could do is plant yourself and dig down deep. 
One of my favorite authors, G.K. Chesterton, said one of the most extraordinary things in the entire world is an ordinary man and his ordinary wife and their ordinary kids eating their ordinary dinner, ordinary life, why is that so extraordinary? When you, when you start a family and you build a family, you're, I, I, I believe that my kids are going to live forever. I believe that all of us are going to live forever. And so when we start a family, right, wealth is going to come and go, but Story and Scout, I mean, those guys are going to be eternally in heaven. That's so cool. It's so cool, but it's, but it's boring in today's world to have a family. It's boring. Chase your dreams. Chase your career. No, do the rooted thing. Do the rooted thing. Do the thing where you do settle in. Do the thing where you do show up on time. Do the thing where you do say what you're going to, you know, you do do what you say you're going to do. Do the thing where you're faithful. Do the thing where uh, it's not cool to show up, but you're going to show up anyways. Do the thing where uh, you don't feel like it, but you're going to do it anyways. Do the thing where uh, everyone's chasing this new idea and you're still reading the same stuff you've read your whole life. Do you see what I'm saying? Do the thing. We all love to chase the new diet, the new theory, the new this, the new that, like it's going to change us. No. Eat vegetables. Move your body. You know, I need the new thing. Have you heard of this? Since I've, since I've been alive, and I haven't been as alive as, as long as everyone in this room, but since I've been alive, I can, I can remember so many different, you know, the, the low-carb phase, the high-carb, low-fat phase, the, the keto phase, the paleo phase, the vegan phase, the paleo and vegan had a baby in the pegan phase, <laughs> the, 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 all these different things. Eat vegetables, move your body. It's boring. Do it. Go to the gym. It's boring. Do it. Read your Bible. It's boring. Do it. You start doing it, you read, and it's not boring anymore. You're like, whoa, this is crazy. How it's you get you get into prayer and you're like, I just I'm not very good at praying. You do it, you're gonna get great at it. It's gonna be so easy. It's literally just talking to God, and you're, once you get over all the awkwardness of like, how do I talk to God, then you're going to be like, oh, this is awesome. Roots, roots, roots. Do the boring thing this year. God is responsible for my up and out growth. God is responsible for the fruit in my life. I am responsible for the root. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he who bears much fruit. And then he says his father is the vine dresser and his father will come and he will cut away the dead stuff from our life so that we can bear more fruit. In other words, God is responsible for how big the tree gets. God is responsible for what fruit appears on the tree. You're responsible to hold on to God for dear life. That's what you're responsible for. Hold on to God. Now, I could talk like for eight years about how to build a healthy root system, how to build a healthy root system. I would just say this. We'll, we'll talk about that another day. I would just say this. Our goal this year should be to dig down. Our goal this year should be, God, I got to be able to withstand the winds of life. But Kyle, we just came out of a really windy season. Isn't it a more calm season? Winds are going to come and go. That's the thing about winds. You can't predict when the next big wind is going to be. You can't predict when the next big storm is going to be. But what you can do is you can dig down deep into Jesus. I want to read this final verse in Psalm. It talks about flourishing like a palm tree. Look at this. The righteous flourish like a palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. I love this verse because I love anywhere, there, anywhere there's palm trees, I'm, I love, Okay. I went to Palm Springs to hang out with some buddies a couple years ago, fell in love because there was palm trees. Go down to Florida, love being in Florida, there's palm trees. Palm trees are awesome, they're amazing. I don't want to just look at palm trees. I want to become a palm tree. That's what, that's what I want. I don't want to just enjoy palm trees. I want to flourish like a palm tree. What is so cool about palm trees? 
Every hurricane, every storm, man, that thing can, it literally, it can bend and touch the ground and pop right back up. Pop right back up like nothing ever happened. But it's got a root system. And so this year, we're going to flourish like palm trees. Our church is going to become a little oasis of palm trees everywhere. There's a palm tree, palm tree, palm tree. But what we've got to focus on is not up. What we've got to focus on is not out. What we've got to focus on is not fruit. What we've got to focus on is root. Let your roots grow down deep into Jesus. God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, God, that we don't have to be blown around by the winds of change, by the winds of deceit, by the winds of doubt, by the winds of of, of, uh, our dreams and chasing our dreams and all that stuff. But God, we thank you that we can be planted. We can be planted. And that the Bible tells us that planted equals prosper. Help us to be planted. Help us to be planted. Rather than chasing our dreams, help us to do what Psalm 37 says. Settle in the land, do what's right, tend to your faithfulness. Then you will take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we have desires, rather than running and chasing them, help us to actually settle down, do the right thing, and take delight in you. And then you will bring about those desires that are in our life. God, when we have doubts, help us to settle down into faith, to trust you. The, the, the Bible says that you are greater than our feelings. And so when we have feelings of fear and doubt and concern, we thank you that you're greater than those feelings. God, when we think about the winds of deceit, help us to be people that are cutting off the head of the snake as he whispers and lies and tries to tell us what we want to hear. God, help us to be people that say, no, that's not right. The word of God says this. Help us to be planted. Help us to be rooted. Help us to be stable. Help us to be dependable. Help us to be faithful. And God, ultimately, the planted tree will prosper. Help us to prosper as we focus on being planted and being rooted. In the name of Jesus, come on, everybody said, amen.